Hi, I'm Bob Garrett. At Hackensack Meridian Health, we believe that all residents need to be informed about the important health care issues that affect their lives. That's why we're very proud to support the important programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Hackensack Meridian Health, Seton Hall University, come see what great minds can do, Valley Bank, NJM Insurance Group, NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan, turn a dream into a degree, the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, and by Fedway Associates. Promotional support provided by Tap Into TV and by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are, there is always something to learn. Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. This is One on One coming to you from the Agnes Ferris NJTV studio in beautiful Brick City, Newark, New Jersey. It's our honor, my pleasure to introduce an icon in our business. <laughs> you like that? Like, no, stop it. Um, Bob Lee who has been the host of Outside the Lines at ESPN for more than a few years. We're taping this show on the 27th of June. On the 26th, Bob Lee, after 40 years at ESPN, it's about the first to go on the air there, Ben 79, announced that you were going to step down. Yeah, retire. And uh, the right decision at the right time for the right reasons. And uh, time to step back, take my life from Mach 3 to subsonic and relax a little bit. Interesting. For those, and hopefully, we don't know if Outside the Lines will continue. Oh, it will. Oh, it will. Oh, yeah. Describe for folks, by the way, go on our website, connect to their website. Yeah. What is that show? Because I've been fascinated by it for years. It, it debuted in 1990. Our network went on the air in 1979. Outside the Lines began in 1990. And we look at the intersection of sports and society, the stories that are off the field, be it uh, race, be it uh, amateurism, be it steroid use, be it corruption issues around the world on a daily, monthly, weekly basis. And it's, uh, it's, we're given carte blanche, and uh, we try not to abuse that, and we've, it's taken me all over the world, and it's been fascinating. You know, you and I had an offline conversation a couple weeks ago because um, you were teaching a master class at mm -hmm. one of the universities we're very much connected to, one of our academic partners, uh, Seton Hall University, and I've done some lecturing yeah. there as well. And we, I'm fascinated by leadership, as you know. You are as well. Mm -hmm. What's the connection in your mind, sports and leadership? I think, and I, I see it on a daily basis. I still use the present tense. I think I'll slip to the past eventually. Um, in just putting, for example, a program together in television, in sports television. It's leadership by example. It's getting a group of people to do something that's greater than they can do separately. It's getting 10 or 12 people around the table or 10 or 12 people in a locker room to sign on to a core set of values and to a common... Uh, agreed uh, goal and, and, and do that. And when you see it happen, and when you see it happen in a team, you see it in rock music. I, you know, the best place to sit, like when I watch the E Street Band and the bosses behind the band, and you know why? Because you watch them making eye contact with each other, when a verbal, uh, you know, is called, and it's the changing off the set list. And you just, you just watch that shared experience come through in the eyes. Same thing in sports. Same thing in television production. I'm sure you see it in your own life. Springsteen um, doesn't have to talk a lot, does he, to those guys? He wants to call the song Two Hearts. He goes like this to the heart. Or he'll just, you'll see them each turn to each other. They'll know. They'll know. And that's, that's teamwork. That's leadership. That's keeping, knowing to keep your eye on the leader, but also understanding we all have a part here. We've got to be trained and ready to do it like that. The other part of it that fascinates me, um, and as I said, Bob is teaching a master class up at uh, Seton Hall in sports journalism. Right. But when it comes to being a leader, sports, media, music, whatever, if you, I don't care how good you think you are. If you don't have a kick-butt team with people, as Jim Collins in his book, Good to Great, likes to say, put the right people in the right seats on the bus. If you don't have the right people and they're not sitting in the right seats on the bus, I don't care how good you are, how hard yeah. you think you can work, right? You have to give them the, the right goal. You have to turn them loose. You have to realize, obviously, you're dealing with you know, some people you pat. 
some people you, you give a little firmer pat. But yes, you, you have to have performers. And, and I see this in our own field. Uh, we have a democracy around the table where there's no seniority to a good idea. I mean, I might be the host, and we might have the executive producer at the table. We might have the producer. But we have an entry-level position, the content associate, mm. 24, 25 <clears throat> years of age. I cannot tell you the number of days I work there where that's the best idea. That's the that's no the bureaucracy. Idea. We're gone. We don't have time for a bureaucracy. <laughs> We're on at one o'clock. This is seven in the morning. I got a show to write. That's a good idea. We all agree. What's right. our treatment? What's our angle? And what's going to distinguish us and make this show unique? Let's go back. Uh, let's talk about this. Forty years, starting '79, right. and on the 26th of June, 2019. I mean, you've interviewed several presidents. Right. Which I'm curious about in the context of being a sports anchor. Uh, we talked to President Ford about it. it. May have been the best athlete to ever be in the White House. Had right. offers to play. Was he at Michigan? Michigan, great center. Lyndon Johnson used to make the joke that Jerry played too much without his helmet. But he could have signed with the 49ers. He could have signed with the Packers. Jerry Ford? Jerry Ford. Bush 41. Mr. Bush played in the College World Series twice. There's a famous photograph of him accepting Babe Ruth's donation of papers to Yale University. The first Bush. Bush played for, he played first base for Yale? Exactly, yeah. And interviewed him on Air Force One. He told me about playing, oh, playing in, a, in, in, in an all-star game in the early 90s or late 80s when he was vice president for President Reagan and getting a double off of Milt Pappas. Uh, Bush 43, George W. owned the Texas Rangers. And we did a long uh, two-hour show in 1998 with uh, Bill Clinton about race and sports. You know, Clinton was often called our first black president. Yeah. And uh, that was interesting. That was April of 98, about three months after the Lewinsky thing had all descended on America. And the, he was not doing any media. And the White House press was, like, sitting in the back watching us like mm. hawks. Curious about this. By the way, if you're listening on the audio side, this is Bob Lee, 40 years at ESPN now, teaching a master class at yeah. Seton Hall University. Your alma mater? Yes. All right, by the Class way, Jen, of 76. All right, Jen, do me a favor. Do, do you have some video of Bob speaking as we're talking about this? You, you, did you give a commencement address? Commencement address uh, back in, uh, in May of uh, 2019. Great honor. What was that like? Uh, I tell you, it's a responsibility because I've sat through a few. Uh, <laughs> both my... <laughs> Well, and, and you, you my know, my mind's going there yeah, right I now. Know, but you know, good from like, eh, I wish it was better. Um, and it's a responsibility because I've sat there as a parent. You want. You want something of substance. The kids, the young adults, they want to get going on. But you also, I, I think when you're an alum, you feel an affinity. Certainly, you, you share the experience. Mm. And I spent some time, and I was, I was happy with it. And it seemed to be well received. Talk uh, a little bit about some highlights. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to say some names. All right. I want you to react, because that's 40 years. All right. You interviewed Pete Rose. <laughs> Several no, times. Not get, well, not getting in the Hall of Fame anytime soon. Did you interview Pete Rose and ask him directly about the gambling? Oh, absolutely. Did he lie right to your face oh, and sure. say, I never bet on baseball? On numerous occasions. Did you know he was lying to absolutely. you? Absolutely. We knew in 89 he was lying. I talked to people who overheard bets being made. We had that in 1989. I mean, it was well known that Pete did this. Pete, Pete was an inveterate gambler on all things, and he bet on baseball, and we knew it at the time. Let's stay on uh, baseball for a little bit as a Yankee fan. Um, you are a Yankee fan. I want to separate myself from that statement. I'm why? A, I'm a Mets guy. You admit that. I, How did you? I, I, I go to meetings, uh, but uh, they can't wash it out of me. But stop. Hold on. How and do I, you go? How do you be the objective journalist that you are? Yes, you express your opinion, but right. it says it's commentary. I mean, what's your commentary about the Mets? How could you? They're well, just I, not a good team. They're a dumpster fire, as you and I are talking <laughs> right now. But I was at the '69 World Series at the age of 14. Did you see Seaver pitch? Please, you're talking about my hero. You see Kuzman pitch. Absolutely. Tug McGraw. I saw Kuzman pitch into the ninth inning of game two of the, of the 89, or 69 series. How much fun was that for you, 69? Oh, Jesus. Every game I followed. Every single game. Scored it off the radio, yeah. Did you realize that you were the second team in New York and always would be? Oh, sure. <laughs> but you you grow, liked it but that but way. If you grow up in Jersey, you've got a chip on your shoulder. And you got to pick. By the way, Blue... You grew up right around a famous ice cream joint, Holston's, yeah, right. where the last scene of The Sopranos... Three by like, blocks away. Check out our website for yeah. countless interviews with Soprano cast members, including the last one, Michael Imperioli. It was terrific. I'm Played jealous. Very jealous. He was fabulous. I'm sure. Listen, Bob, you, you didn't work long enough to get the interview. <laughs> okay. okay, by the way, why do, you, why do you love The Sopranos? I promise we'll come back, back to sports. With Bob, you can talk about anything. Go ahead. Because it goes back to that time when it was not Jersey Chic. 
I mean, they shot the pilot in 97. They, and of course, Bruce Springsteen, brought Jersey into the into the sheet category. And Stephen but, Van Zandt? Oh, my gosh. He was yeah. right in there? Going to see him in concert shortly with the Disciples of Soul. Um, but it was so true to the ethos of Jersey. Chase did such a good job with the geography. David Chase, I, mean, right. you, you, I went to school with 300 Carmelas, you know. <laughs> Probably David. You too? You. Oh, yeah. I mean, not by name, but, you know. Yes, I understand. Exactly. And, and he just captured what it was to live in New Jersey. And it was so dead on perfect. Okay, let me go back to baseball. All right. The whole bunch of people are not getting into the Hall of Fame. Right. Forget about Pete Rose. Mm -hmm. Talking about Bobby Bonds. Right. Talking about others. Barry uh, Bonds. Uh, excuse, excuse me. Thank you. That's I just made that, myself. I've made that mistake okay. a number of times. Barry Bonds. Barry Bonds. I'm talking about A-Rod. I don't right. know what's going on there. Never I'm talking happened. about Roger Clemens. Right. Never happened? I don't think so. These are one of the greatest players of all time. Steroids, that's it. You're out. The rules give you a prescribed period to be voted in. Their totals are edging up a little bit, but I don't know that they will edge up to that 75% threshold that by the time their eligibility to be voted. Then they go to the old, to, to, to a different set of, of voters, a smaller set, subset of voters in Cooperstown. I, it's unlikely. It's unlikely. Do you have a vote? No, I do not. If you had, would you vote them in? I'd have to say no. 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 I mean, we you know what the tests were um, and what the results were and what the rules were. No. Got it. How about this one? Football. Outside the Lines has done okay. a great work in the area of head injuries in football. Mm -hmm. Right? We have a son who's actually playing football. How old is he? 14. Are you comfortable with that? No. Okay. No. Um, we'll talk about that another time, but right. I lost that discussion. All right. Could have banned him from doing it, but no. didn't. I saw his helmet the other day. It was big and packed, and I was praying that it would protect him enough. You're against the game, aren't you? I'm not against the game. You're against how, well, you're very concerned I'm, about the injuries. Uh, uh, we've done a lot of reporting on yeah, the science. The best stuff. And what we, what we know and what we don't know. It's like the Don Rumsfeld conundrum, you know, the unknown unknowns. Um, and it, the science has not been treated gently over the years. Finally, I think, all the authorities in the sport, the leagues, college and, and doctors are on the same page. But uh, an increasing number of people who know what they're talking about say you shouldn't be playing tackle football until you're in high school. And, and you see culturally in other parts of the country from where you and I are sitting, ages 5, 6, and 7. They pat them up. Uh, it's not prudent. It just isn't. Yeah. How about this? Several minutes left. Let's sure. try this. I'm going to try to cover as many topics as possible. Should we be paying college athletes who are making big money for their schools? Absolutely. They deserve to have... That's a yes from that's you? That's a yes. That's a yes. It's just... It, it first, when the right judge gets the right petition written the right way, this is all going to get blown up. Uh, and the NCAA is a voluntary institution. Look, there are billions of dollars at stake. There are coaches making over $10 million a year coaching packages. That's even without the deal from the sneaker company. Yeah, uh, well, you know what, which almost pale in comparison to what the alumni are putting. This is private money to, for the most part. It's not all public money. Right. But it's out there. The TV money is astronomical. And the kids, the young kids, the young adults, they are the product. Pay athletes? I think you have to. Now, you open a Pandora's box, can you pay just that sport? What about the so-called non-revenue sports? But it has to be addressed, and at a level beyond where they're willing to go right now. It's interesting. Now. That's the kind of stuff you've looked at for years. Yeah. And when you're teaching... My thinking has evolved on this. What do you mean? Oh, I'd say 20 years ago, oh, amateur sports, the value of an education. And education, nothing's more important to me than, than seeing someone get an education. But colleges are willingly recruiting kids, especially in, in basketball, knowing they're only going to be there a year mm. or two. And it's a deal that everyone knows what, what the deal is. There's so many other things I want to talk about that, but I want to try this one. Sports journalism right. changed dramatically because of a million reasons. Biggest is? There are more people out there with access and the ability, a lot of smart people doing things in platforms. And you just don't have to be on ESPN. I mean, you can sit there and upload your own. There's some great reporting being done. Hold on. The digital thing... Night and day from when you started in oh, terms gosh. of the ability to deliver a product? You could work weeks on a story. Hey, we're going to hold that for a week from Sunday. We got that story. Give it to the desk. We got to tweet it now. What about the editing process? There, Listen. That's you know, very I, tough. Bob, Bob, he's not going to tell you this, but Bob Lee started that suburban cable, TV3, right. right. 70s. 76. 76. Right. I was a little after that. I right. was with that crew as well, with Matt Lockham, with a great team. Just saw him Bruce this week. Beck, yes, I worked Bruce with Beck both over those at guys. NBC, right. The best guys ever. Right. Look at the editing process. We're sitting in the room. We're met. Not that I was a great editor. Trust right. me, I wasn't. I had somebody to press the buttons. But I'm thinking they're cutting it down to a minute and 20 story. 
Where's the editing now? Where's the vetting? Where are the gatekeepers? Yeah. That is an issue. Speed versus accuracy. Fairness. It's, it's a, that's the big push-pull on a daily basis. But the metrics by which so many people are judged are clicks, follows, retweets, likes, and that happens. What are you telling your students now? That that, that, that should be the metrics? No. Or, in fact, some higher, the, different standard? The basics matter. But you're going to have to adapt to the reality of, of, of the marketplace. And so, yes, editors are more important than ever. And what's scary, at a lot of places, they are fewer than ever. Because what do you mean? Cutbacks. Cutbacks. Print. Even in some digital enterprises. Yeah. You're going to miss this? There'll be days I'll miss it like a son of a gun. Um, but I... I'm at peace, but I talk to people who've been out. You know, you go through the three, four, five stages. Uh, but I'm, I know there are so many good people, especially where I work, they're going to carry on. I, they'll let me down. If they, they're not going to let me down. I Before know. I let you out of there, the most important aspect of how ESPN has impacted not just sports culture, but our culture as a society. Wow. I think we had a hand in the in reality of the sports entertainment industry. It used to be just games. Now it's a sports entertainment industry, and I'm proudest of the fact that we are a cultural Identity. You can't write the story of the United States in the last 40 or 50 years without there being a chapter on it. A lot of networks have viewers. Only one network has fans. ESPN, I'll tell you what, I don't know what I do in the mornings working out in the gym. And I, yes, we listen to news. Yeah. We do all that. Of course, we check NJTV news every morning as well. You check replay. your portfolio too, I know. I, I know. Listen, Day, money, mean? who cares? About, never yeah. leave that alone. But without ESPN, I'm not sure what I do. Listen, Bob Lee is, uh, for 40 years, has been um, doing great work at ESPN, outside the lines. Before that, a lot of other works lurk on location everywhere yeah. else. And now, they're doing a master class at Seton Hall University. And uh, I look forward to seeing you up on campus, my friend. You too. Well done. Thank you. I'm Steve Adubato. That's Bob Lee. And that's why we have a great show. <laughs> see you after this. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Luis Robles, who is a captain and goalkeeper of the great New York Red Bulls. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Growing up as a kid, was soccer your thing? No. No, it wasn't actually what was? baseball. So my dad comes from Puerto Rico. He was drafted into the military back way in the day during the Korean conflict. And so eventually, much, much further down the road, when he had me and my brother, he put a lot of baseball in our life. It was, whether it was the Yankees or the Mets, he just grew up with that. And, and that was his thing. And, and up until about 11 or 12 years old, that was my thing. So, so soccer comes into your life. You get the bug. You're good at it. But the goalkeeping position, explain to people, we'll get into a whole range of other um, partnerships and collaborations that uh, Luis and the Red Bulls are involved in. But mm -hmm. I'm curious, goalkeeper versus the rest of the folks on the team? Well, I smile because he said, I get the bug and I'm good at it. And that's, that's totally not the case. I, no. wasn't, I wasn't good at all, actually. Stop it. No, so my story starts with me getting cut. Uh, 11 years old, I try out for a soccer team. And the only reason I try out for this travel team is because my best friend, Sean was trying out for the team. And now he, he was very good. He was one of the best players on the team. And yet after the first day, they said, thanks for coming out, but don't worry about coming out tomorrow. Right? To you? Yeah, to me. And so what ended up transpiring is a couple weeks later, their goalkeeper is not sure if they want to do it full time. And, and Sean suggests my name. And the, call coach, the coach calls me up and asks, hey, if you're willing to play goalie and just goalie, right, <laughs> you can be on the team. And for me... It just seemed like an opportunity to be able to hang out with Sean more often. And so that's when I caught the bug. Standing in goal, defending shots, that challenge of standing there and trying to defend the goal was something that really spoke to me. And at that point on, it would just become a passion and obsession. And, and slowly I became better and better and better. But as I look back at my career, there are so many opportunities that came out of nothing that I sort of seized, but it wasn't, it wasn't purely because of talent. I gotta tell you, you just helped an awful lot of kids and parents of those kids who are dealing with who didn't make the team, who's on the B team, who, whatever. So thank you for that. Yeah, no problem. Um, talk about the connection between you, your colleagues with the Red Bulls, and Hackensack Meridian Health, because I know there's an initiative, it's called Child Life. Correct. Talk about right. it. And so it's something that comes from Hackensack Meridian, but 
the partnership started when I joined here at the New York Red Bulls. I think one thing that's incredible about our organization is that we, we don't just talk about being in the community, we actually do it. You see the front office, the sales team, the players are constantly engaging in a way, whether it's visiting hospitals, showing up to activities, or inviting kids to come in, design shoes. Last year we had this really cool initiative where patients at the hospital came to the training facility, they designed shoes, we had an, a shoe artist put the graphics on the shoe, and then at one game, uh, at one selected game, the kids came and we presented the gifts to them. And it's things like that that really permeate throughout the organization that is ingrained in the culture. Mm. And so for a kid who also had parents that were constantly talking about giving back, giving back, it became low-hanging fruit to join in with all these activities. And so now what's occurred is the last couple of years, we've had this partnership and then exclusively myself and my wife, we've also come alongside and say, hey, what can we do? How can we help? And by the way, you have three young children. Three young kids. And, and that's actually where the relationship continues to deepen is all three of my kids are born here in Jersey. They were born at Hackensack Hospital. And so we just have an affinity towards them. And, and when that partnership already existed with the Red Bulls, it became easier for us to get involved. I know there are two kids, uh, Diego and Jack, I Correct. think, and they're the ones who were selected for this initiative connected to Child Life. Do they actually, what do they do? Do they hang out with you guys, spend a day with you, and then what? Play? Get on the field? Do what? So I'm not sure what the selection process was like to select them, but it seems like we have two great candidates. And what we're trying to do is just brighten their life. We know that they're going through certain situations in their life. Certain challenges. Absolutely, that can be discouraging at times. And so for us, the challenge is simply, how can we be a bright spot, a positive uh, impactor in their life? And so what we're hoping to do at least is they, I'm gonna get to see what it's like in their, a day in their life, and then on the flip side, we're gonna invite them to the training facility and they're gonna see what it's like a day in my life. And this will ultimately culminate with them taking in a game at Red Bull Arena. That's awesome. And this actually started with the Tackle Kids Cancer Initiative, which we know very well. In fact, you should go on our website. We'll connect you to the, the football giants and the folks at that uh, healthcare system, Hackensack Community and Health, are connected to it as well. They're the ones who are driving that initiative. They've helped an awful lot of young people. Let me ask you this. Young people, I'm curious. Our kids are all involved in sports one way or another. The, the disappointments, and you talked about that before, the frustration, the not making the team and, or not making the A team, whatever that means, or starting. Or What have you told, and your kids are very young, but given the fact that you're an elite athlete, my question is, how do you give us advice as parents? What should we be focusing on? What should we not be focusing on when it comes to our kids in sports? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is that they should be having fun, right? At the end of the day, they're kids, and they may have dreams. I was six years old when I told my parents I was going to be a professional baseball player. So I, I knew early on it wasn't a joke. It was like everything about my life was geared towards being a professional athlete. I, it transitioned later to 14 years old when I had to pick between baseball and soccer. And at that moment, I went with soccer, not knowing which one was going to provide a better outcome. And yet the reason I chose soccer is simply because of my friends, right? Sean was still right. in the picture there and, and my three best friends played soccer so I wanted to be with them as much as possible and though they're, I'm very competitive and I'm very self-motivated, the underlining foundation to all of it was having fun with my friends. And so when parents ask, and I get this question all the time, like what are the secrets, what, how, what advice can I give to my kids? It, it's always shrouded in this idea of having fun. fun. But when it stops absolutely. being fun? When it's, not, when it's not fun, you're gonna lose motivation. That's and right. then at that point, you're gonna force yeah. something upon them. And if they're not motivated to do it themselves, it's a losing battle. But there's something else I say, and disappointments are inevitable, right? Failures, disappointments, it's not just all of it, it's inevitable. Yes, in life, and education, in relationships. But discouragement is a, is a, is a mindset. All right, so if you can help your kid by encouraging them, by supporting them, then they're gonna be able to get over the disappointments. But if their disappointments transition into a mindset of discouragement, right. it becomes that much harder. Yeah, real quick, 30 seconds. Connection between sports, I'm fascinated by leadership. I'm a student of it, teach it, coach it, think about it, real quick. You are the goalkeeper, you are the captain. Are you the leader? I'm one of the leaders. What right? does it mean to you to be the so leader? So we have a saying that we learned when we went on a, 
um, on experience at West Point, right? West Point's this great yeah. academy that it's just, awesome. it's a factory manufacturing leaderships, right? Or leaders. And they told us that good teams are accountable to their leaders, but great teams are accountable to each other, right? And so at that moment, you realize that in order for us to be great, they can't be accountable to just me or the coach. That's right. We have to develop within them the confidence that they can lead. And if we have a bunch of people leading but also understanding what it takes to work, I think we're going to be that much more successful. You just helped a lot of people. I hope so. Thank you. And wish you all the best. Thanks for having me. Okay. This is Luis Robles, who is the captain and goalkeeper of the New York Red Bulls here on One on One. Great guest. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 30 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Hackensack Meridian Health, Seton Hall University, Valley Bank, NJM Insurance Group, NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan, the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, and by Fedway Associates. Promotional support provided by Tap Into TV and by New Jersey Monthly. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Perfectly orchestrated. In sync with your life. Hackensack Meridian Health is redefining how health and care come together. Because when everything works together, your world gets better. Hackensack Meridian Health. Life years ahead. <laughs>